sorry to break the coffee break. Uh, I know a lot of interesting discussions going on at the coffee break. Um, and let me once more thank the organizers of the conference to give me the opportunity to come once more actually in this beautiful place and at this very inspiring conference. Um, and to also give me the opportunity to talk about my work uh, here uh, today. Um, as an oceanographer, well, we have been mentioned before that uh, this conference is very interdisciplinary. And as an oceanographer, for me, this implies that actually the type of questions that I will ask and the type of methods that I will show here, they have a little bit of more applied kind of feeling. So I will show methods and things that can contribute, for example, to fishery management or uh, uh, mitigation of climate change or conservation of a particular species. So we don't really wish to go, or at least we don't have the aim to go towards a sort of a universal law that can explain anything. But uh, more trying to produce simple models that can help us in understanding something. That's the general idea. So I was carried away about the discussion we had the other day about the physics boring, biology complex. Uh, it's actually quite interesting discussion there. So I could go with two offerings here. One is that all models are wrong, but uh, well, we don't want to say that. So the other one that actually is interesting uh, is this paper that you probably might know uh, that say, I mean, in a kind of difficult English, I venture another and perhaps equally reckless generalization. Nothing makes sense in biology except in light of evolution, subspecies evolution. And a good friend of mine, a physicist, uh, Simone Pigolotti, some of you may know him, it says that a very good approximation of this sentence is this one. Nothing makes sense in biology. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> Which I kind of agree with him, but uh, yeah. So we try to make some sense out of it. And uh, uh, my main motivation in this one is actually about uh, long distance migrations in, uh, in, uh, in the ocean. This is something, it's a well, very interesting topic, of course. Uh, has been evolving over the years because we didn't really have much data before uh, in tracking fish. So, for example, understanding of tuna migration was based on uh, hooks found on the tuna uh, in Spain, uh, but they were coming from uh, hooks that were produced in uh, Brazil, for example. It's stuff like that. So, deduction between populations moving from one place to another. Today, we have a little bit more advanced uh, way of understanding these tracks or these trajectories or these migrations. Uh, with these uh, satellites uh, pop up archival tags. Uh, they are not as precise as the ones that are, I suppose, commonly used in terrestrial ecosystems because we don't really have the GPS signal going underwater. And fish, most of the time, they spend the time underwater or in a dish. But uh, um, uh, they basically rely on additional information like uh, light level and temperature depth. And based on that, you can reconstruct quite accurately the, the location that they have been migrating to and from. Uh, so, and the, the recent one that I showed on top from uh, Sequeira and uh, colleagues is 2018. They actually, they claim that they have enough data now to start thinking about these migrations in a more quantitative way. So, in uh, describing maybe patterns for different class of animals uh, of migrations. One of the things that actually strikes me, well, what they found is that Okay, they, they don't move much randomly, but they have a kind of ballistic motion. Makes sense. Uh, and they all do kind of long distance migrations. That also makes sense, but yeah. One thing that actually is interesting is that the correlation between this uh, maximum distance that they travel and the size of the body. There is a very interesting paper by Hein and colleagues in 2011 where they actually derived this from a mechanistic approach. So they understand the thermo well, the metabolic cost of migrations or movement and the type of uh, either if you want to walk, fly, or swim, and they can actually predict this correlation, this allometric function, uh, quite accurately. And this actually for swimming organisms, I try to put one point for copepods, so zooplankton species. They are about one milligram, and they can still migrate vertically for about a kilometer, and still it fits with that slope. So quite interesting stuff. Something that sticks out of this is uh, turtles. And turtles is actually one special animal in many ways. Uh, first of all, is also because we can actually, in that case, attach some sort of GPS tracker to them. So we have actually quite good trajectories for them. And the other thing is that 
they stick out of this curve. So they are, for their size, they migrate much more than the other fish, apparently. So I just want to talk about turtles, basically. That was the excuse to talk about it. So a colleague of mine, Graeme Heiss, working at the moment uh, in Australia, Dawkins University, contacted me saying, well, I have these tracks. They're nice, very high precision. But they change over the years, quite often. So for example, they had, for 2010 and 2011, uh, migrations, they have a breeding ground in uh, Greece, uh, Zaxintos, I think it's called the island, and they migrate for the feeding ground in, uh, in the African coast. I might even have a pointer. Yeah, here. But for this year, they are quite uh, straight. Uh, they go, I mean, from the origin to the final destination in a, quite a straight line, while in other years, uh, it's more convoluted path. So if they were like a humans walking in a square, one hypothesis could have been that they were all drunk, for example. But since our fish, well, not even fish, reptiles, uh, swimming in the ocean, first hypothesis was that um, it could be something related to the ocean currents. So that the currents uh, in this specific year, that was 2010, should be stronger than the one in 2011. From a visual inspection, actually, we couldn't do much. It uh, doesn't look like that, at least, very striking pattern on that. If you actually extract the velocity along the trajectories, it seems that actually, on average, these velocities are stronger. But we kind of use this data to motivate ourselves to look a, a little bit about uh, uh, the concept of migrations for long distances in a shear flow. So this problem was actually presented at the beginning of the last century from uh, Ernst uh, Zermelo, quite a famous mathematician in, uh, in many sectors, including uh, control systems. And the idea is basically, okay, the question is, what is the minimum travel time from zero to one in a shear flow like this? So you have a weak current here and a kind of stronger current up here. We expanded a little bit uh, upon this concept saying, okay, let's say that the turtles are using different behavioral rules to navigate in this field. So for example, they use like, okay, they fix the direction and they start swimming. So what you will get, depending on the velocity of the current, you will get a deviation of these trajectories away from the target. If they adjust their heating while navigating, then it depends on the relative velocity between the, the velocity at which they, swim and, uh, they are swimming and the velocity of the current. You might have different type of curves, including this type of banded curves, still getting to the final destination. But if you want to cross this in a minimum time, you will do something quite different. So you will swim against the current where the current is weak, and then you, you will lose the current actually to, to go faster towards the target. So we tested these hypotheses with the different tracks, and well, for some of them, these behavioral models, they seem to kind of agree qualitatively. We have some metrics to do it in a quantitative way. For some of them, they really didn't agree much like for example in this case. In other cases, some of them agree, but the optimal one seems to stick out most of the time as the one that actually doesn't really uh, take it. So this is an example of the type of simulations we have been doing, and the analysis actually is based on some sort of Markov process to define this uh, optimality curve. And here is another example where basically, yeah, we didn't really get uh, at all. The black one is the, is the observed track, and this one are the different models. As you can see here, it's like, okay, it's a different, totally different type of behavior in the sense they get somewhere, then they realize for some environmental conditions that this is not the place where they want to go, and then they make a correction about it moving along the coast. So when you introduce this in the model, you kind of mimic a little bit what they do. So they are definitely not optimal in what they do. And that's, yeah, showing some metric in terms of crossing time for the different behavioral models. But the main message is that they are really not optimal. What we didn't write in the paper is that uh, if you actually then play a little bit with this velocity field, uh, changing it randomly, either the departure time or the different years, in a way giving a kind of a, a climatic envelope, because this current can change quite a lot. So they are not optimal yet, but they are not too far from the optimality. So they are not optimal, but not even totally stupid in that sense. So we want to expand a little bit on this concept, and we are working with, uh, uh, well, uh, Jerome, that is now a PhD student in my institute, 
Antonio, who is here and co-organizer of the conference, and uh, Uwe Tigsen, to expand on the concept and using maybe control theory to understand what type of behavior they are actually using. So the mathematical model that we are thinking of is that the trajectory is actually a composition, the observed trajectory is actually a composition of the velocity field plus some swimming. And this swimming could be in sort of uh, considered as a control velocity. And there is some noise. This noise is either because they do errors during the navigations, but also because uh, the currents are kind of mesoscale uh, structures in the ocean that can affect them. And then we make explicit in the cost function for this migration two terms. One is the metabolic cost of swimming with some function of gamma. And another one is actually the, the crossing time. So the fact that they have to get there at a given time. Otherwise, they miss maybe mating opportunities or feeding opportunity or they don't, want, they don't get enough food or whatever. Plus, we also include a term modulating what type of personalities, if you want, uh, they use in this migration. So are they taking risks, uh, going maybe into areas of strong uh, velocity of the current that goes against the direction they want to go, but men could be better after that? Or they don't take risk, they are risk neutral or risk adverse. So we are working at the moment on this, it's very much uh, work in progress. We have been using different tracks then to do statistical inference of this, using this model. And we have tracks for whales and turtles. Something that seems to come up from this uh, work is basically that they cluster. So these behavioral traits, if you want, these terms of gamma, beta, and alpha, they could be considered different type of behavioral traits. They seem to cluster for different type of organisms. But as you may notice, I mean, turtles, they don't really travel in groups. So this has very little to do with the group formation and decision making that I'm supposed to talk about. Um, but fish, they do. They move in schools. And uh, one thing to consider about fish is also that when they move in school to reach different feeding grounds, for example, they really compete with each other. I mean, the worst competitor for a tuna is another tuna, most likely. So since I will go to talk about tuna, I'll just introduce it a little bit. And uh, um, Bluefin tuna, which is the Atlantic uh, bluefin tuna that I will be talking about, is among the largest uh, marine animals uh, that we have. Uh, it can be long up to five meters, uh, 700 kilos. Uh, it can basically live everywhere in the Atlantic Ocean, from tropical areas to polar areas. It has a, it's warm-blooded, so it has a cardiovascular system that is actually quite similar to the human one. We have been fishing it for uh, ages. Uh, so, and at the moment, it's a very high valuable commodity, fish commodity. It moves in schools and uh, opportunistic feeder. So one thing that is actually interesting is that they can live basically everywhere, but they, to reproduce, they only go in two places, the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea. And actually, even in the Mediterranean Sea, very specific locations there, apparently. That's interesting. And also, they do this in a very narrow window of time about 15 days, maybe three weeks. So after that, they move out, most likely, and they migrate in different places. As I mentioned before, we have tags for this species, thanks to the group uh, a foundation called Tag a Giant, actually. They did fantastic work in tagging these animals uh, and showing us, more or less, their distributions. So I don't want to spend too much time, but basically, this shows that they are distributed all over the North Atlantic, with also presence in the, in the Mediterranean, um, quite a lot of time spent in the western part of the Atlantic Oceans. The thing that is interesting is that different seasons, they seem to have, they are widespread, but actually they have a kind of hotspots of aggregations. Uh, and they seem to migrate between these hotspots. So this week, actually, we can use it for, to model the behavior of migrations across the different uh, hotspots. And we use kind of network theory approach where we have different nodes of the network uh, with different habitats. These habitats might change over time because of uh, changes in, uh, well, habitat quality, temperature, food, or whatever. And then what we want to understand is basically the um, changes in time of the population in the different uh, habitats, different highs. So that basically depends on how many are coming in minus how many are going out. But the decision about going in or out depends on some sort of a reward function 
that has a utility based on the fact that they will get some food in the habitat, but also some cost of migration. To make it short, this is basically a framework for a game theory uh, model applied on a network. And uh, it's, I mean, has some complications in solving it, but of course there's a value that uh, you can have different strategies emerging from this setup, so different fish moving in different places. Uh, and we can sort of validate these uh, dynamics based on the time series that we have in some of these places. So what we get from the model uh, is basically that the phenology of these migrations are reproduced quite correctly. Here, different colors are different classes. So we had like a, the full demography of the bluefin tuna from the young of the year to the adults more than 80 years, I believe. Some regions, they only have presence of the adults, for example. Other regions, they have a more mixed population structures. That seems quite a, in agreement with what we observe in different areas. The other thing we can do is to reproduce uh, or having emerging uh, migration routes out of this one, because not all the routes are used. This one is basically showing the distribution of biomass in the different locations, and the full line is basically an active route of migrations, where a dashed one is a migration that is not used, a route of migration that is not used for some reason. And you can see changing some of the parameters of the model, basically what you get is that some of the more extreme nodes in the network are kind of excluded from this migration game. So take home message from this is basically that there are uh, different strategies con can coexist in the population. The phenology seems to be okay. And uh, uh, when conditions in the habitats are good, all habitats should be full. But this doesn't quite fit with what we observe. Oh, you cannot see a map here. Can you see a map? Well, there was a map of the Atlantic. And uh, what it shows is the presence basically of the bluefin tuna from the Gulf of Mexico in the Mediterranean Sea, North Atlantic, but there is something missing, which is there are no more tunas in the North Sea on the Nordic areas. And they were used to be there. So these are landing time series of tunas from 1900 to 2010. What you see is that there is a peak here of landings. So these are the amount of tuna that have been catched uh, in, uh, in uh, North Sea and Nordic Seas. And then there is a kind of sharp decrease and then zero tuna. So the zero tuna before is basically because they didn't know what it was. They had the tuna present in their fishing operations and they were annoyed because they were fishing herring and this tuna was eating the herring. And then they didn't want to have this tuna, but they, they didn't know that was a tuna. Uh, so at some point they realized that actually the, the single tuna that they were trying to kill was more valuable than the old herring that they have catched during the year. So they, they started fishing it and was very valuable fishery for a few years. And then it collapsed completely. So why is that? Yeah, this is just to show that actually there were tunas before uh, in the area, quite abundant actually, before they started fishing. And this is a, an image of the tuna stored in, uh, in Denmark during 1946, I think, or something like that. So one of the good year in these time series. So why is that? Why we don't have tuna? Maybe because the stock is too low, so they don't get there? Well, no, not quite. So this is again the time series of landings. Now in this case, I think it's biomass converted with some fishing effort. And this one is the spawning stock biomass. So it's the total population of the bluefin tuna. I mean, it, there is some change, but not quite substantial as this one. So there should be tuna in the North Sea. What about the prey? The prey had a reduction in that period, but now it's fully recovered. It's actually very abundant. So why they are not feeding on this very abundant stock here? Other things like temperature, salinity, no, doesn't matter. Just to show you, yeah, maybe I have a little bit of time, just to show you how the fishing is actually done for bluefin tuna. There are big vessels around in the Mediterranean Sea, for example. Uh, they have big nets here. Uh, in these operations, they have to locate the school. And what they do for locating the school is, should be visible in a few seconds. Yeah, they use airplanes. So they go on airplanes, an experienced fisherman goes on that, and they start looking around for a school of tuna that most of the time is actually on the surface. 
And then when the, the school is identified, they release a small vessel. They start extending this net around the school quite quickly. Moving more or less at 10 nodes. Okay, still moving. At some point, they close the net and they take it up. But actually, they don't kill them. Yeah, now they are closing the net from the bottom. Some of them, of course, are killed by the operation, which is quite, well, it's stressing quite a lot of them. But not that many. It's a very minor fraction that is actually killed in this one. Yeah, those are the ones that didn't make it. But now what they do, they call basically another vessel coming with a big, big cage, 100 meters diameter. And what they do, they attach this cage to the net. And then they transfer the entire school into the cage for fattening. So the tuna is better when it's fat. And each gram actually is money. A single tuna of that can be like worth $2 million on the Japanese market. Well, it's one single because it's an auction and they really want to pay for it because then the restaurant becomes very famous. Nonetheless, hundred thousands of dollars easily for a single tuna. So then we send a diver in the cage to see the operation. This is the cage. They attach it there. Yeah. but it's a bit longer than a few minutes. This is the diver. At some point, you should see how they actually enter the cage. Yeah, here. So this basically is transferring there, and they stay for months in these cages, uh, fed with uh, anchovies, sardines, and other things. Uh, not very efficient, but uh, definitely economically viable. and to close down with a nice cool formation that you will see in a second. We didn't really analyze this. Actually, I'm not even allowed to show it, but now it's a few years that we have collected, so I feel free to, to show it here. Yeah. So maybe you will not get much out of my presentation in terms of the models, but one thing you will remember next time that you order your sushi is the airplane. That's, uh, that's the way they catch it. So, but going back to the migrations, again, sorry for the quality of the map here. That's the Mediterranean Sea, and this one is the, uh, well, North Sea here and the uh, Norwegian Sea up here. So, what it's showing is that, I mean, in the past, we had this migration route used by many of them. So, all kinds of classes, from the young of the year to the old tunas. Uh, after a few years, we had, especially after the 70s, when they entered with the big vessels in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, only the big ones were traveling there. But now it's really zero. There are no tunas in the North Sea. So why is that? Did they kill all of them? Or the actual question here is, how, where is this information? How did, where is it lost? I mean, where is the information about migration path? So we have some ideas about it to answer basically where is the information about the migration path uh, stored. And the idea is that the, there was some sort of a collective memory that was destroyed somehow by the fishing activity. So we have a paper called, which is a very nice, nice title, maybe the paper is not that good, but the title is great, Fishing Out Collective Memory of Migratory Schools. And the concept is that, uh, well, I'll show you in a second, you can build a model to explain how the information can be stored in a large group, and how this can be perturbed by uh, humans. So the general idea is that uh, each individual is able to interact socially with others in the group, and only a fraction has the information about where to go, the right direction to go. 
And social interactions uh, might be used by the, each individual, basically, to enhance the knowledge about the direction to go and reach a sort of consensus. Well, yes. So how do we build the model? The model is basically based on an, is an agent-based, an individual-based model. And uh, each agent basically has his own uh, information, but also the ability to interact with the other agents with some rules, probabilistic rules. And we could use like a spatially explicit type of model, like the VSEC model or uh, some other with alignment and uh, uh, avoidance uh, of velocities. And uh, uh, well, here again, there is some missing stuff. But we didn't use that because, I mean, space information in this case is not really critical for us. So we went for another type of approach that actually has been showed yesterday as well using gra graph theory. So we have nodes in this network, and these nodes interact with some probabilistic rules among each other. But what you have is two types of dynamics here. One is the dynamic on the network, so the links, creation, and destruction. And the other one is the change of preference of the fish, so the internal dynamic of each node. This work has been done in collaboration with a former PhD student here at the CISA, Giancarlo De Luca. And yeah, it goes a little bit in details. I don't know how much we have to go into details, but uh, we have a given number of uh, individuals in the group, and each one has an internal preference about where to go. Uh, the state of the system is basically defined by this, uh, the neighbor network and the preference of each of them. As I mentioned before, we have two types of dynamics. One is the internal dynamics of the network, and the other one is the uh, internal dynamics in the nodes and the dynamic on the network. In a not very simple way, we can basically solve this uh, master equation. But let me focus on the probabilistic value, solely for the quality of the plots here. There is some extra colors that is missing, but the point is that you can go from this configuration on the network where basically I and J, they don't have a connection. But if they share a preference about where to go, then they can make up connection with some probability, eta in this case. So we have a basically a given function for the probability to make a connections between two individuals in the, in the network. And equally, we also have a probability, and yeah, well, I'll say it later. We also have a probability to destroy this network or destroy the link, the specific link, with another probability. So it's really stochastic. Each agent can change its internal state. Uh, and the internal state depends on the preference that they have for a given destination. So we have a number of destinations, Q destinations. And for each of them, there is a preference. So when they are not linked, they will update their internal state. If they have a strong preference, there will be more, there will be a higher probability for them to select uh, the destination where they want to go. But they can still change destination and go also going maybe in destinations that where they don't want to go. Especially when uh, they select a destination where they don't want to go and then they link to other agents. So in that case, basically, they are forced to go somewhere else. The main message here is that there are no real leaders here. I mean, the information is there, but it's not clear if this information, under which condition this information can emerge. So when they are linked to each other, we have a voting mode, uh, voting model, uh, so sticking basically with the majority, which seems to fit with the, well, at least mimicking uh, more or less the, the spatial explicit uh, type of model of Wiesbeck, Wieszczek. And uh, yeah, we have some uh, rate of frequency also in updating these, uh, uh, the links that they have internally. So uh, the H value here uh, measures basically the strength or the preference that each agent is, has for uh, some specific destination. That's what we have to keep in mind. I'll skip the detailed balance, and I'll go to this invariant distribution that we can derive. One thing to notice in this, well, first of all, yeah, it's quite complex, but uh, one thing is actually interesting is that the, it, this ratio appears, so it's basically the ratio of probabilities to make a link over the probability to destroy the link, and this actually can be merged in a single parameter that we call sociality. 
So how social they are in making links, how frequent they can make links. Then we can also notice that we have an age dependency here and also the dependency on the number of people, a number of individuals that have information. Five minutes. So uh, let me show you the results. We analyze them in terms of what is called in network theory the giant component. So we try to understand in which conditions the system actually behaves like a group or there are groups formed and where these groups are going. Are they going to their preferred directions or they are going somewhere else? Let's start looking at the results when there is no information. So in this case, we have a bunch of individuals and they don't really have a preference. They can go any of the Q destinations that we have. If the sociality is very low, we are on this branch here, then there is no group formation. They are all like a small groups here and there, but there is not this giant component emerging from the system. But you can see that there is also a solution where we actually have a very polarized network, a very coherent network, or all the individuals linked together, or most of the individuals linked together, and this frequency, or the number of individuals there, there is not changing over time, so it's stable. And there is a region where basically you can have two solutions. And this is also kind of, uh, yeah, missing color, but some hysteric cycle, basically, that we reproduce without information. We can also solve the system analytically, basically, in some conditions. So for not a given number of individuals, but for an infinite number of individuals. And the solution basically fits with the numerical predictions. When we introduce the information in the system, there are two effects, which you cannot see, but trust me. <laughs> So the first one is that actually the, we have Q destinations. One has a preference for the group. What you get is that the one with a preference is the one that is stable or the one that is most frequently selected. But you also have Q minus one destinations that they can still be selected by the group. Plus, you still have this uh, possible transition from no schooling to some schooling. So you have three solutions here. No schooling at all, schooling it to the wrong place, or schooling to the preference. And this depends on the number of individuals that are informed and the preference that they have for the given place. Well, this one was a key figure, which is basically invisible, but uh, this line is the critical line that I showed you before of the transition. And here there is a shade of blue that basically tells you how this critical zone shrinks, increasing the number of informed individuals. Basically, to make the group moving, uh, you need like 15% of the individuals with some information about where to go. In that case, the most likely configuration of the model is that you have a school and it goes to the right place. If you change the preference, so in this case you increase the preference, what you get now is a little bit more visible, but you get that this fraction is reduced. So here you need like 17% of the individual with information, here you need less than 10 and the group is formed and the direction is taken up. So how does it fit with our tunas? I showed you before these landings and the dynamic of the prey. Maybe some of you can already notice that this kind of cycle here, it's a sort of a hysteric cycle in the system. So if you start putting this data on a face plot like this with the herring biomass here and bluefin tuna biomass here, over the years there is a decrease in the biomass of both predator and prey. And then at some point, no tuna anymore, but the prey are increasing. Hysteric cycle that we also find in the model. So this one is a plot of a fraction of informed individuals, polarization of the network, so schooling efficiency, and the preference for the habitat. If you start reducing the number of individuals with information, and also killing the prey, which basically means over time you are reducing the preference for that specific habitat, you quickly go towards that rapid transition here where there is no more group formed. And now even if you increase the preference because the prey are back, you don't form the school anymore. So an hysteric cycle that seems to be in the data and is definitely present in the, in the model as well. I don't know how I'm about with time. Two minutes. Well, this one is basically the last slide, I think. But now, good news, because I mean, in the model we predicted one thing. So, 
collapse based on the fact that you are fishing out the information, but possibility of recovery, because when you are here, if you allow the group to regain that information, you can basically jump this transition here, and you're back to a very good kind of dynamic in terms of migrations. So we predicted that in 2010, and to Narbeck, thankfully. Uh, well, we, we have been cited by the Danish uh, national authorities saying, oh, they say that. And um, so to Narbeck now in the North Sea, um, very recently, a couple of years, uh, first observations of few vagrants individuals in the area, and now over the years it seems that this information is regained in the group. So now they know the place again, and it seems that they are going back. We started basically a tagging program on it, not very easily done because these tags, they are not very reliable, they detach easily. So, but we started making some investigation about, uh, well, now that they are here, this is Denmark, Copenhagen is down here, and those are the ones that actually we have been tagging. Some of them, they went back to Spain. So it seems that the route that uh, historically was lost is now back in business. I think I'll stop here and thanks all the people that have been contributing to this. Thanks. <laughs>